Welcome to 3ABN Today Bible Q&A. My name is J.D. Quinn. I'm going to be your host. I want to introduce you to our special people here, our guests. I respect each one of these people that I'm getting ready to uh, mention. They work hard in getting these questions together. And I might say that these questions, some of these questions are extremely difficult. And we have three minutes or four minutes to answer these questions. And boy, sometimes they're going to be talking fast. So I'm not going to go through a lot of rigmarole. We're just going to introduce. We're going to get with it. Okay. At the end of the table, by Skype in Southern California, James is a good friend of 3ABNs. He's part of our 3ABN family. Tell us about yourself real quick. Good to be here, JD. Thank you. We are just uh, thankful to be part of the 3ABN family, 3ABN team, and we're looking forward to the Bible questions today. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Ryan Day, it's always good to see you, Ryan. Amen. Always a blessing to be on 3ABN Bible Q&A, and I definitely can second the fact that a couple of the questions I have today are some challenging ones. Yeah, but you have a way of simplifying things, so we're looking forward. We're going to certainly try. (laughs) And the lady that I had lunch with today... Shelly Quinn, it's good to see you, Shelly Quinn. <laughs> good to see you, honey. I um, just want to thank each and every one of you for your questions. You give us an opportunity to do this for you, and it helps us because we get to study in depth and try to distill it to a simple answer. Amen. Three ways to contact us. If you want to contact us with a question, perhaps you're studying and you run across something that uh, I don't quite understand. If you want to contact us via text, it's 618-228-3975. Thank you'll see it on the monitor there. 618-228-3975. If you would like to email it, it's BibleQA at 3ABN.tv. Once again, Bible QA at 3ABN.tv. And if you choose Instagram, 3ABN underscore official. Once again, 3ABN underscore official. Now, if I went through them too fast, probably about 30 minutes from now, I'll share it again with you, just so that uh, we got our notes straight. Pastor James, we're going to have yes, prayer. Sir. Would you start off by having our prayer? Absolutely. Father in heaven, just want to thank you for this opportunity to seek your throne of grace and to ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide and and lead us, to give us answers from your word that are uh, responding to the questions that have been sent into 3ABN. We're so thankful for this privilege. We're thankful for each one of our listeners. Send your Holy Spirit to be with them also, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to start with you, James. This is a long question. When we're in the kingdom, will we know and remember our spouses and family? Will we know and remember the times together on earth? I know there is no marriage or having children in the kingdom, but will the family we have here still be the same as in the kingdom? And this is from Tyann in New Jersey. Great question, Tyann in New Jersey. The answer to that question is yes, yes, and yes, here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall we know even as also we are known. So this describes how God sees us. He knows all about us. And someday we will see ourselves as we are seen by God. And in that heavenly eternal uh, day of joy, we're not only going to be known, but we are going to be of of God, but we're going to be known by others. For they're going to see us as we are, just like God sees us as we are. In fact, when we look at this in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11, notice what it says here. It's Jesus Christ is describing the kingdom of heaven. And he says here that we're going to sit down. Uh, Many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So obviously we still have identities. Mm. Abraham is Abraham, Isaac is Isaac, and Jacob is Jacob. And we're gonna sit down with them and we're gonna be able to recognize them as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're gonna be identified as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of course, we'll be identified as who we are. Now, there's another Bible verse I want to share with you. Uh, This one is the Mount of Transfiguration. 
And this is when Jesus Christ was transfigured, his countenance was glorified, and there were two persons with him, Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah were with Christ because Moses had been resurrected by Michael, and Elijah had been translated without seeing death. So both of these people were in heaven, and both of them were sent down to encourage Christ during his earthly ministry. Mm -hmm. Now, when this transfiguration took place, James, John, and Peter were with Christ. And they recognized Elijah, and they recognized Moses. So Moses and Elijah were identifiable and recognizable. Now, as far as remembering the times that were together on earth, that may vary. Um, you know, we're definitely going to have the Bible for sure. But what about our personal memories? You know, I'm in my early 60s, and I can't always remember everything I've ever done in my life. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we're a thousand years old mm. or a million years old or mm. a billion years old or a trillion years old? Some of those memories are going to kind of fade away just a little bit. And we've got to recognize that we're not always necessarily going to remember, be remembering everything on planet Earth, but we're going to be making new memories. And we're going to have our loved ones with us who've chosen to be saved along with us. And we're going to be making new memories with them. It's going to be an amazing time to live forever. But there's one thing we are going to forget. According to Revelation chapter 21, we're going to forget all our pain, all our sorrow, all our crying, and all suffering. Praise God for that. Amen. Great answer. Great answer. Pastor Ryan, mm -hmm. your first question, are the 10 horns and the 10 toes on the image concerted the same? And this is from Gary in Florida. Amen. Thank you, Gary, for submitting this question. And I think it's a great one. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, the same 10, ho ho the 10 horns that we see in Daniel 7 are represented as the same that we see there in the 10 toes in Daniel chapter 2. Now, how do we come to this conclusion? Just to make some connections with the time that we have from a biblical perspective, we know that Daniel had the vision of a metal man. He saw a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, uh, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron. And of course, when you get down to the feet, the iron continued into the feet, but now the feet uh, has an extra added element of clay. So the feet was made of clay and iron. And then of course you have the 10 toes there. Each one of these sections of this metal man uh, represents a kingdom. We know this to be the case because in Daniel 2, Daniel actually reveals uh, the succession of this, uh, this kingdom starting with the head of gold, which he identifies as none other than the king of Babylon or the king of Babylon. So we see this in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 38 where he says here, I'm looking at the second part of the verse here. It says, it says, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. Speaking to the King Nebuchadnezzar of uh, Babylon at the time, he says, you are this head of gold. So now we have a clear starting point. We know the head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. And then of course, from there on, it goes on to say, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And then verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. We don't need to go to any other really external source to figure out who the next two kingdoms are after Babylon, because right there in Daniel chapter five, we see that the kingdom of Medo-Persia, uh, the, the alliance of Medo-Persia represented by the two arms of silver. Of course, they were the ones who overthrowed uh, Babylon. And then we see also this is confirmed in Daniel chapter eight as well. Uh, but we also know that the third kingdom, this kingdom of bronze, of course, the kingdom of Greece. We see this confirmed also in Daniel chapter 8 as the kingdom of Greece overcomes the Medes and the Persians. What the Bible does not reveal directly is the fourth kingdom by name, but we do see based on the timing of, uh, of the New Testament authorship and the timing of the New Testament and Christ's ministry, Rome was the next kingdom. It was in, in authority during Jesus' day. And if you follow through Daniel 2 there, talking about the toes, verse 44, speaking of the days of these kings, we know the toes representing the 10 divisional kingdoms of, of Rome at the time. Rome eventually was divided in 476 A.D., 
into 10 divisional kingdoms. It was still the empire of Rome, but it was weakened and it was divided into 10 regions. We see this in Daniel chapter 7 when we read there uh, about this fourth beast that had 10 horns. And we're told there in Daniel chapter 7 verse 24 that these 10 horns are 10 kings. So same thing as the toes. And of course, we know that these kingdoms, of course, would go on to become the Alemanni, which became the Germans, the Franks, the French, the Burgundians, the, uh, the Swiss, the Suevi, the Portugals, uh, or, or the, in Portugal, uh, the Portuguese, uh, the Visigoths in Spain, the Anglo-Saxons of England, of course, the Ostrogoths, uh, uh, of course, and the Heruli and the Vandals were exterminated, but then you have the Lombards in I Italy. So these were the 10 divisional kingdoms. And so we do find consistency from Daniel 2 to Daniel 7 between the 10 toes and the 10 horns. Shelly, now let's go to you for your first question, all right? In the fall, almost all guilty parties received immediate punishment. Humans were cast out and the serpentine ate dust. But Satan, the mastermind behind the talking serpentine, went unpunished. When I heard that Satan used to be co the covering cherub over the mercy seat, I just couldn't understand how he stood the glory of God and why God extended mercy to him and the fallen demons for centuries going unpunished after an unfathomable evil they had caused the humans. I don't accept the usual answer that God doesn't want to appear as a dictator and kill those who did wrong. Could you, God could have taken away their power to call damage to humans. Can you please explain? Wow, that's a long one. <laughs> What I'm going to have to do is use the Bible for the parameters. So let's kind of establish this story from Scripture so that someone who's not familiar with it can follow. In Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17, we see that Satan was indeed a covering chair who walked in God's presence. And then he began to traffic lies. We see in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, Satan became so filled with pride. He was narcissistic and he wanted to be exalted. He wanted to be like God. And he trafficked these lies to a third of the angels and brought them down to, they were all cast out of heaven. We see that Jesus said in John 8, 44, that Satan is the father of lies. He, lying began with him. And Revelation 12, 11 does describe him as the great dragon, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. All right. Adam was not deceived. We see that in 1 Timothy 2.14. Adam sinned intentionally, and when he sinned, we find in Romans 5.12, human nature was changed. The DNA, the spiritual nature of Adam was changed because he was corrupted. And Romans 5.12 tells us, through one man, sin entered into the human race and death through sin. So Adam did more than break covenant with God. When Adam intentionally sinned, he voluntarily surrendered what the sovereign Lord had given him as control of the earth. He submitted himself to Satan and Satan became, a, the dominion of the world was delivered to Satan and had to be restored. God is not the author of evil and you can maybe not understand his ways are higher than our ways, but he has a purpose for everything and works everything according to his will. So we see that what he's doing is allowing the consequences of evil to be witnessed and recognized for his redemptive purposes. God cursed the serpent. You're right. The serpent didn't crawl on his dust until God cursed him after the sin because the serpent allowed the devil to use him as a medium. God cursed the devil. There is no turning back for Satan. He is doomed for the lake of hellfire. He didn't curse humanity. He just placed judgments on them. But what I love is immediately in Genesis 3.15, we see that God introduces his everlasting covenant. He introduces the Messiah and he made a pathway to restored righteousness by faith in the coming Messiah. So here's the point. 
I'm not sure I can answer in any other way. Um, had God immediately annihilated the devil and the fallen angels, there's a good number of them, all of the rest of the angels would have been very confused. They would have wondered if Satan's, the lies that he trafficked about God, if they had substance. So the Lord had to prove himself not only to these angels, but to all of the onlookers of the universe. I believe that the Bible clearly shows us that although God does not need counsel uh, to extra counsel from anyone to establish his will, I believe that the, the Bible shows us in Job and First Kings and in Daniel that God had a counsel that came together and he graciously allowed these created beings to have a say so. And they all agreed that Satan should be given a short time to prove or disprove his theory. And so I believe that God is morally bound by rules of engagement. He accepted that counsel and he has given Satan a short time. Here's the point. A thousand years is like a day to the Lord. It may seem long to us, but God does have a plan. He is going to restore everything. We who are faithful to him and who have our righteousness restored by faith in him, no matter how much we've suffered and, and that suffering is actually adversity helps develop our faith and our character. We will live forever face to face with him in a world without sin or sorrow. Amen. Good answer. Amen. Uh, Pastor James, in the context of the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict, can you give us an explanation of how prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and the conflict in Palestine are connected, if at all? So is a great question. Ezekiel 38 is uh, an Old Testament prophecy, and it really finds its second self in the New Testament book of Revelation and chapter 20. And like Revelation chapter 20, Ezekiel 38 kind of represents this final judgment that God is bringing against all the nations uh, and we see that more clearly in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, all the nations that come against Jerusalem in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem comes down uh, from God out of heaven. And we see as the city comes down from God out of heaven, there's a, there's a second resurrection of the wicked and the wicked surround the city and prepare to attack the city. Now with this background in mind, let's read Ezekiel 38, one through three. It says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog the prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companions that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword, that is from death, and be gathered and gathered from many people in the mountains of Israel, which had been long desolate. That's the thousand years of desolation. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. That's Israel, God's people. You will ascend coming like a storm, the resurrection of the wicked coming against the city like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, and you and all your troops and many peoples with you. That's Ezekiel chapter 38, one through three, and then verses seven through nine. So when we read these verses and also read what it says in Revelation chapter 20, when we put these both together, we see a connection. And the connection we see is that God is describing the same event, the surrounding of his people who've been redeemed, the resurrection of those who've been killed by the sword, surrounding the city and seeking to destroy God's people, to destroy Jerusalem, and then God bringing judgments down upon them. And we see this as we continue to read Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 18 through 23. When we prayerfully compare these verses with Revelation chapter 20, we're going to see that both chapters are really describing the same event. Event. They're describing this great white throne judgment when the wicked along with the devil and his fallen angels are punished for their sins. And the final fate is this lake of fire and brimstone, which brings them to ashes according to Malachi 3, 1 through 3, and also Ezekiel 28, verse 18. And so God is using some of the same terminology in Ezekiel 38 that we find in Revelation, and that makes sense. 
because Revelation is simply borrowing from the rest of the Bible to describe the events that God is uh, revealing there in Revelation 20 and 21 are revealing the events of the final judgment. Ezekiel is where that's borrowed from in a large part. Wow. Thank you. That was one of the complex. Ryan, mm -hmm. question two. What does Genesis 3.16 mean? It says, your desire shall be for your husband. And this is from Menduzi. All right. Thank you for this question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just read the text in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, and we'll make some comments. It says, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So obviously this is within the context of the aftermath of the fall when God is pronouncing these judgments upon Adam and Eve. And here he tells Eve that your desire shall be for your husband. And, uh, you know, for years, I know many people look at this text and, you know, in the modern sense of the word desire, it almost makes it sound like, you know, she's desiring in a way like, oh, I just, I can't get enough of him. I need him more and more and more and more. And, and, and it, it, they kind of apply a sexual connotation there, which I don't believe that's necessarily what this is talking about. Right. If you go into the original Hebrew here, the Hebrew word for desire is teshuka, teshuka, which means longing. It means a need. And so it's simply saying that she will always have a sense of need and longing to be with her husband, to be around her husband, to be with her husband. But I will also say the same principle Eve applies for the husband, because when you get to Genesis 2, 18 and 24, just the previous chapter, this same connotation is applied even to Adam for Eve. For the Lord says here, in starting in verse 18 in Genesis 2, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for man or that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Notice the word comparable, equal to him, different roles, but again, the same and equal. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. My mind goes over to Paul's writings uh, where he talks about how a woman's uh, a woman is does not control over her own body her own body but her husband is and then of course the husband's body is not his own but of course her husband's there's an equality here that the Lord is establishing and we see in in both of these sections early on in Genesis the husband will sense his need for his wife for he shall break away from his father and mother to be joined together with his wife because he needs his wife and the same uh, sentiment is followed as well that her desire her longing her need for her husband will be even greater than what it was before because, of course, it's God's plan that they remain together as one. And so I believe that desire there is just an even more intense recognition that it wasn't God's uh, plan that a woman each should even go out to be by herself or uh, isolated alone by herself, but that she should sense her longing desire and need for her husband. And, of course, the same applies to the man as well. Very well put. Very well put. Shelley, your second question. What passages confirm that Jesus was fully man and fully God? And this is from Jacqueline. Jacqueline in uh, British Columbia. Jacqueline, I hope you have a pen and a paper handy. Let's look at Jesus' divinity, which is identified by his pre-existence, by his creative acts, and by his authority. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. I'll read from the NASB. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus emptied himself of his divine privileges, but obviously not of his deity. Colossians 1.9, Colossians 1.9. Paul says, in the man, Christ Jesus, there still dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 1.16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. 
John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with in the beginning with God, all things were made through him and there was nothing that was made that was not made through him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, the worlds were made through Christ and it says that he is the express image of God. He's the outraying, the affluence of God. He was appointed heir of all things and he upholds all things by his mighty word of power. And then it says that when he had purged, he himself had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus said he existed as one with the Father, that he's claiming equality with the Father. The New Testament identifies him as God. I don't have time for all those references. Jesus claimed to be God. And at the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus prayed in John 17, 5, Now, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. Now let's look at Jesus' humanity. The Lord of glory stepped out of heaven, out of eternity into our time, took on our flesh, was born as a helpless child, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, in Bethlehem, becoming like us. Now, he came to stand in, to become, not just to stand in as our substitute for sin, but he came so that he could become the new representative of mankind. In Hebrews 2.14, it says, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And then Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. We know that Luke chapter 2 tells us about Jesus' birth. He was Mary's firstborn. Luke 2.52 tells us that Jesus had to grow in wisdom and stature. So we see, and in favor with God and man, we see his humanity. He had physical needs and emotions. He after he fasted for 40 days, he was hungry. He wept in John 11, and the tem he had temptation and suffering. Hebrews 4:15 says, "We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our, empathize with our weaknesses, but he's been tempted in every way, yet without sin." So, he, as a man, Jesus had physical limitations. As the Son of God, we recognize. As Christians, we recognize his dual nature. Amen. It's good. I mentioned earlier that we were about halfway through. We would have, uh, I would bring up the contact list again, how to get in touch with us. If you have a question, if you want to text, it's 618-228-3975. If you want to email us, BibleQA at 3abn.tv and if you choose to use Instagram 3abn underscore official. James, we will pick up with you now for your third question. Can you please clarify Matthew 18 20 where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. When I worship and pray by myself, does that mean that the Holy Spirit is not present with me? And this is from Chris in Colorado. Thank you for your question, Chris in Colorado. You know, many times it's the context of a Bible verse that can give a fuller meaning to what the uh, author is seeking to communicate, what God is seeking to communicate, the Holy Spirit is seeking to communicate. And this is the case in Matthew 18. In its context, it's speaking of uh, church decisions, specifically uh, disciplining church members. And we can read a little bit of that. Uh, Verily I say unto you, it, it says here, that whosoever shall, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For, this is the verse you're referring to, for, now notice, the for denotes what's gone before. For, 
where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. So you see here that the two or three gathered in his name is directly connected to church decisions, specifically in relationship to church discipline. So a verse that will help us to differentiate these verses from solo believers and answer the question at hand is going to be found in Paul's experience of being left alone in uh, Rome, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16 to 18. Notice what it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16 to 18. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray that God, pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16 to 18. So consider that even though Paul was left alone, God was speaking through him to reach the Gentiles. God also delivered him from every evil work. That's what the verses say here. And Paul was assured that God would preserve him unto his heavenly kingdom. So this phrase is an insur this last phrase is insurance that God was with Paul to preserve him from discouragement, from the apostasy of others around him, and from his own potential apostasy, so that Paul would eventually be in God's kingdom. A second Bible reference is found in the experience of Elijah in the Old Testament. Elijah, who was alone, yet the Lord was with him in 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions, if the Lord be God? God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. No one stood with Elijah, but God was with Elijah. How do we know that? Because Elijah prayed a prayer solo, and even though no one was with him, God answered that prayer and brought fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice and even the water that was poured into that sacrifice to make it manifest that God was with him. So God honored Elijah's prayer, even though no one stood with him. And even when Elijah eventually fled to a cave where he was there alone, God came to him. God counseled him. God corrected him. Uh, God uh, gave him his next mission. So definitely God is with us even when we're alone. We can see that from these biblical examples. And there are many more, like Job, for example, who was forsaken by his his friends and his wife, and, and John the Baptist, who was alone in prison, and even Jesus. Uh, God was with Christ when he was on the cross, and he felt like uh, he knew that all his disciples had forsaken him, and he felt like he was forsaken of God. Now, understand, he felt forsaken, but by faith he was victor. God was with him, even though he didn't feel God's presence. He went through that experience for us. So God is with his people even when we feel alone. We might say, especially when we feel alone. As the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Thank you. Ryan, number three. This is another complicated one. When does one day of the Lord in Zechariah 14, 1 to 4 take place? Before, after, or during the second coming? Verse 4 says his feet will be on the mountain, which would imply after. But the city is still being ravished, which would imply before. But the graphics uh, smiting in verse 12 would simply imply during. But that would mean his feet can't be on the mountain. Can you please help me understand? And this is coming all the way from, from Australia, from Cameron. <laughs> Well, let me, let me just state for the record, this is one of those passages that I think most ministers today, uh, we are reviewing this, we're learning this, we're still not quite sure on all of these details because there are many passages and words in here. There's lots of heavy allegorical language in determining uh, what this means uh, pertaining to the final events of Earth's history. However, I believe that there are multiple clues throughout this passage that clearly uh, communicate to us if we are students of the Word and we, and we apply them correctly and allow them 
the word of God to interpret itself, we will see that this day of the Lord uh, and, and his feet touching down and all that stuff that we're going to read, it's not pertaining to the coming of the Lord at his second coming, but actually a thousand years later uh, when he comes back with the new Jerusalem and the people in the city. And then of course the final destructive wrath uh, through a plague of fire comes down and devours the wicked. We're going to see all that here. Let's go through and see some of these details. We're not going to be able to get to all of them for lack of time, but it says here in verse one of Zechariah 14, behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. And we have clue number one in verse two, for I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. Automatically, when I, when I read this, my mind goes to Revelation chapter 20, because we read there in Revelation chapter 20, after the thousand years are completed in verse eight, it says that Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. These are events that happen at the end of the thousand years, not at the beginning. So this isn't second coming. This is after, a thousand years after the second coming. But we go back and continue reading. It says the city shall be taken. And that's what confuses a lot of people. They say, well, if they have taken, I thought the, the people, the God's people are already in there. If you look at the original uh, Hebrew word here for taken, it's lochad, which actually can mean occupied. And we know that they're in the strongest of coordinates. Occupied would be a better word to apply because we know that the city of God is occupied by God's people there in the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And he goes on to say the, uh, the houses are rifled, the women ravished, half of the city shall go into captivity. The half of the city, that makes sense being that we see this comparison between the righteous and the unrighteous all the way through scripture. We have the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. We have the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, those who receive the mark of the beast, those who have the sale of God. We see this comparison all the way through. So we know in the very next line, it says, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. That's consistent again with Revelation 20 and 21. When you go on through, it says the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in the day of his, you know, as his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east and on the, uh, and on the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of the mountain shall move toward the south. Now, many of our evangelical friends will apply this to the second coming. This is clearly an after the thousand years have finished text here. So this is referring to Christ coming back and how will he fight those people? Well, we know he fights them as we see there in the way that Revelation 20 verse 9 uh, uh, reveals to us. It says, then the wicked, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The fire that comes from God, that's how he deals or fights or battles with these wicked. There's much, much more I can say about this. You go on and read about how there will, there will be no light and then there is light. We see that in verses six and seven of Zechariah. Well, this is consistent with when Christ comes back, all of the light is removed. We see this in Isaiah where it talks about the moon will be disgraced and the sun be ashamed. And uh, in, in Jeremiah chapter four, he says that the, the earth was without form and void and the heavens, they had no light at the presence of the Lord. Uh, and then he says uh, in verse 28 of Jeremiah four, that the heavens above be black. Uh, but when you go to Revelation 21, we know that when Christ comes back uh, at the end of the thousand years with the people in the city, that it actually says that the city had no need of the sun or the moon uh, to shine in it for the glory of God illuminates it. The lamb is its light. So that's consistent with the end there of, of Jeremiah chapter 14, verse seven, when it says uh, that it will be light. So you go through this chapter, there's lots of heavy symbolism and lots of allegory. We talk, we see the living waters there. We see that consistent with Revelation 22, where we see the waters pouring from uh, the throne of God going out uh, to, to the tree of life. And, and all the way through this, there are so many clues that indicate to us that this event is not talking about the second coming. This is talking about a thousand years later at the end of the thousand year millennial period when God and the new Jerusalem city comes down and God deals with sin once and for all. And he does away with the, uh, the enemies of God, which is what is happening there in Zechariah 14 verse 12. There's your next sermon. That's wonderful. That's okay. <laughs> You should do I am very sermon. impressed. Amen. Number one, that you can talk that fast. <laughs> and number two, connecting Great those answer. dots. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shelley, number three. How do we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And this is from Sherry in Arizona. Sherry, I love your question. And, you know, Jesus instructed his disciples to make this their top priority in Matthew 6, 33, when he said, seek first the kingdom of God. And 
all these things will be added unto you. So Jesus came to preach about the kingdom of God. He tells us in Luke 17 that the kingdom does not come with observation, nor will they say, oh, see here or see there, but the kingdom of God is within us. And I like what Romans 14, 17, what Paul wrote. He says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness. That's a key point there. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, right standing with God, right acting, doing according to his will, with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So how do we seek? First, we become fully dependent upon God. People miss this often. In Matthew 18 and verse 3, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, unless you become like a little child, you shall by no means enter into the kingdom. What is he saying there? Children are dependent upon their parents. They look to their father for the provision. They look to their father for instruction and correction and wisdom. God's plan of salvation, righteousness by faith, he wants us to be fully dependent upon him. In Romans 3.22, Paul says that this righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus, so as we have faith in Christ, to all who believe, all. No difference between Jew and Gentile, he says. And then in Philippians 3, 9, he says, oh, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So how do you seek the kingdom of God? Seek God's face. Seek a relationship with him. Get into the word. God speaks to us primarily through his word. Do Bible study and prayer. Tell him you thirst and hunger for his righteousness. Matthew 5, 6 said, blessed. Jesus said, you're blessed if you do, because if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you're going to be filled. There's three steps that God gave me to surrender. You've got to know God. So study his word. Stop resisting his love and submit to his authority. And then finally, yield to the Holy Spirit. So this means that as Paul said in Ephesians 4.24, we're going to put on the new self and be created like God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. Amen. Good. Pastor James, your last question. Can you explain the discrepancy between 1 Kings 8, 9, 2 Chronicles 5, 10, and Hebrews 9, 1 to 5? And this is coming from South Africa, Cecilia. Thank you for your question, Cecilia. Great question. So 1 Kings 8, 9 and 2 Chronicles 5, 10 are basically saying the same thing. 2 Chronicles 5, 10 is a repeat. Let's read that verse. It says here, there was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. So this verse, 1 Kings 8, 9 and 2 Chronicles 5, 10 are basically saying the same thing. You've got the two tables of stone in the ark when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel as they came out of the land of Egypt. Now, Hebrews 9, 1 through 5 says that verily there was the first covenant, which had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. There was the tabernacle made, the first, that is the holy place, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the most holy place, Hagion, Hagion. And in this second veil, it says, was the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the gold pot, that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, which we cannot now speak particularly. So the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews, as you pointed out, is speaking specifically of these items that were not mentioned 
in the two verses that you mentioned, 1 Kings 8 and 9 and 2 Chronicles 5 and verse 10. So why the discrepancy? Well, really what we have here is these items are being mentioned because they were added after they came out of Egypt. That is, they came out of Egypt, they were just the, the, the tabernacle, the, the tables of stone in the ark. And then later on in number 17, verse 10, there was this conflict about who should be the leader in the camp. And the Lord told Moses, number 17, 10, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels and they shall um, take away their murmurings from me that they die not. So in this showdown, Aaron's rod budded. And as a remembrance of that, God said, let's put that in the holy place also. And then also in Exodus 16, 33, Moses said to Aaron, take the pot full of an omer, full of manna, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generation. So you've got the manna and Aaron's rod that budded added to the most holy place. But by Solomon's time, that's talking about 1 Kings, by Solomon's time, over 400 years later, it appears that the pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded uh, were no longer with the ark. And this can be explained or understood be due probably very likely to the fact that the ark had been out of the possession of the priests uh, during some of the warring period uh, before Solomon's time. Uh, Saul, under Saul's kingship, the ark was lost. And uh, perhaps these items, some of these items were lost. So in Hebrews, the apostle Paul is simply referring to the fact that these articles were originally included in the most holy place. And um, now it seems in the context of this uh, later on when uh, Solomon's uh, there, that those items are no longer part of the most holy place. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good. Pastor Ryan, please explain about forgiving people of their transgressions against others so that I can be forgiven. That's something that we need to know. All right, yes, yeah, so the Bible is very, very clear on this, and I probably won't take my full time explaining this because the, it's just so clear. Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. This same message is repeated many times. And of course, Jesus sharing his heart here is saying, look, how can you expect God to forgive Forgive you if you can't forgive your brethren also of their trespasses. We read of this in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. We also see the same message repeated in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. But perhaps maybe the most convincing story of all is the parable that Jesus tells of the uh, unforgiving servant there in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 to 35. I won't read the whole thing, but it's interesting that this servant comes to Jesus and, and, and one, or to God, of course, Jesus represented by God here, and he wants. Uh, he wants to be forgiven of his debt. And so God has compassion on him and forgives him of his debt. And so he goes off and finds another servant that owes him, takes him by the neck and says, give me my money that you owe me. And when that servant falls down to him and says, please forgive me, give me time to pay you back. He demands payment because he can't pay. He throws him uh, in, in the jail and, and all this big mess. And so when God hears of this, this is what God's response is to him. He says, you wicked servant, I forgave you of all the debt because you begged me should not all should not also you have had compassion on your fellow servant uh, just as I had pity on you. And then in verse 35, he says, so my heavenly father also will do to you if you, to each of you uh, from his heart does not forgive his brother of his trespasses. That's Matthew chapter 18 verses 23 to 35. So the principle here is that yes, we just like Christ forgives us, we're unworthy of forgiveness. But if your brother comes to you and he's humbled enough to ask forgiveness, we should grant that to him because at the end of the day, your sins nailed Jesus to a cross and he forgave you. Amen. Oh, amen. Shelley, last question. How, go, how does the Holy Spirit explain the sinful nature of humans? This is from Gloria in Georgia. Gloria, the first man, Adam, was the first representative, created as the first representative of mankind, the human representative. And we find in Acts 17, 26, that all men are made of one blood. We all came from Adam's line. Um, when Eve was deceived, Adam was not. We find this in 1 Timothy 2, 14. He sinned purposely and his intentional sin had a universal impact. Romans 5, 12, 
just as sin entered the world through one man, death and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people for all have sinned. Romans 3.22 shows how pervasive it is. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus said, very truly I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave of sin and the consequences of sin separate us from God. We find in the Bible that the sin nature is depraved. It is selfish. Sometimes it is predatorial on others. And Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, this depravity of humanity required we redemption. We can't restore righteousness by ourselves. So we have to recognize our need of a Savior and that God demonstrated His love. Romans 5, 8 says, He demonstrated His love that while we were still sinners, He sent His Son, Christ Jesus, and he gives us a new heart. And now 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, because when you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone. Amen. Mm. Amen. I can't believe that we've got all through the questions. We're going to take a short break and then we will be right back for a closing thought. So if there's some thought that you forget to that you forgot to share with us, well, we'll be ready. Just a few, a uh, few minutes. If you're enjoying our 3ABN Bible Q&A, then tell your friends. Each Monday, we'll bring you a fresh program answering the Bible questions you send us, using God's Holy Word to shed light on those texts that seem difficult to understand. To have your questions answered on a future program, just email them to us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. You may also text your questions to 618-228-3975. That's 618-228-3975. Be sure to include your name and where you live, and then watch 3ABN Bible Q&A for answers from God's Word. Welcome back. We just want to see if we got any additional comments or final thoughts. I have one comment. If you are seeking the kingdom of God, start your day off with God to seek mm. his kingdom and his righteousness. Psalm 63, verse 1, David says, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you like the water in a dry and weary land. So if you will seek God and say, Lord, lead me, God will work in you to will and to do His good pleasure. Amen. Amen. I just want to encourage anyone out there who's struggling with forgiveness. This is a gift from mm. God. And the Holy Spirit wants to gift you with that. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And the Bible says also that if we ask anything according to His will, 1 John chapter 5, it says that He will grant us that if it's according to His will. And I believe it's totally, as we just found out, according to God's will, that we seek forgiveness of others and we grant that to others. So don't don't miss out on the kingdom of God, having received forgiveness from him, but you have not extended it to others. Ask for God to give you that gift now. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Tyann in New Jersey had asked about, will we recognize uh, one another in the new heavens and the new earth? And I think I forgot to mention that question was probably predicated on the fact that this mortal must put on immortality and this corruption must put on incorruption. We're going to look different. We're going to have new bodies and they're going to be without blemish and without spot. And we're going to grow up as calves in a stall. We're going to be bigger and stronger and more beautiful. And God in that context uh, makes it very clear that we are going to have a different appearance. And so the idea of recognizing each other might, that's a great question when you bring it into that context. And of course, uh, one of the things that, that is going to stay the same is going to be our character or personality. And of course, all of that is, is uh, taught in the Bible. So yes, there's going to be this transformation, but at the same time, we're still going to have an identity, a character that people are going to recognize. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you quickly Psalms 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, 
but we will remember the name of Jesus. God bless you. Thank you.